required to uh, be visually supervised, like I said, unless they're old enough, that they've been through like driver's ed, uh, and they have a, a driver's license, a motorcycle street license, or they're in the process, uh, like my kids, uh, getting their instructional permit and learning to drive, going through driver ed. Uh, and operators under the age of 18 are not allowed to carry passengers at any time. This law was written at the time before the ROVs were really a significant part of the OHV market. And so what that law means, no passengers, it means that your 14-year-old son or daughter cannot sit in the driver's seat and have you in the shotgun supervising them. That's a bad thing, and we are working to get that changed. Right now, unfortunately, that is the letter of the law. So you still have to supervise them. You just can't sit in the seat next to them while you're doing it. Uh, this table shows the various requirements on public land for, for kids and adults. Uh, there is a version in your, in your handout. I'm sorry that it didn't print very legibly, um, uh, but it basically sizes up the requirements uh, for kids riding on ATVs. Uh, on side-by-sides, there's a different set of requirements, but on ATVs, this is what they're going to be dealing with. Uh, when they're operating, they have to have their safety permit. They have to be wearing helmet and eye protection. Uh, they have to be supervised. And there's certain engine sizes that, are kid, that kids are allowed at certain ages to operate. Uh, so what we're really seeing in New Mexico is that kids are being allowed to operate full-sized machines. And full-sized machines nowadays can be 800 cc's, 850, even 1,000 cc's. We're talking machines that are capable of 110, 115 miles an hour in a wide open desert environment. And kids are being allowed to operate those machines uh, even without training on, pri on private land, and that's not a good thing. Uh, so the law, uh, as it was put in place, requires if a kid is under the age of 10 years old, they are limited to a 110 cc ATV, and that's pretty much a kid's ATV. Uh, until they turn, uh, or once they turn 10, until they are uh, 15, they are limited to a 250 cc ATV, uh, there's an exception to that. If they already have a driver's license of some sort, then they're allowed to operate up to a 450. And then after they turn 16, then there's no more restriction on the engine size. Uh, adults are not required to have a safety permit, although it's always a good idea. Uh, they are required to uh, uh, wear eye protection if they're operating on a paved road. Otherwise, the helmet and eye protection law does not apply to them. Uh, there's no visual supervision required of adults, even though some of us need it. Uh, and then uh, there's no engine limit on uh, ATVs. Any questions on that? Uh, the other thing we're really concerned about is engine size is one thing, but the physical size of the machine is another. And for kids, there is a requirement of what size of machine they're allowed to operate. So when a kid is standing on the machine, straddling the seat, we want to see at least three inches of space clearance between their butt and the top of the seat. And that means that they've got enough room to rise up off the seat and use their legs as extra shock absorbers on the machine. Very important in bumpy terrain. When they're sitting on the machine, see if I can do this without falling over, their upper leg, their thigh bone, should be as close to horizontal as possible. What we really see when kids are too big for the machine that they're operating is that their, uh, their thigh bones are, are overextended up and their knees are fouling with the uh, handlebars and interfering with their ability to steer or operate the controls. Uh, when they're gripping the handlebars, there should be a perceptible bend angle to the elbows, and that means that they're not uh, hard, having a hard time straining reaching to the handlebars so they can still steer the machines. And that when they're steering the machines, they should be able to operate the thumb throttle, the kill switch, and the brake lever or clutch lever if the machine is equipped with the clutch uh, with at least one knuckle of one finger uh, to be able to squeeze and operate that control. If a kid is too large for the machine or too small for the machine, they often cannot do that. And this is a very important thing. What we're seeing nationwide is the kids that get into trouble on the ATVs. It's because they're riding machines that are too big for them. Uh, so uh, the law uh, allowed the Department of Game and Fish to go ahead and create a safety training program. And what we've put together is uh, a couple of different ways that folks can get training. 
Uh, one is through our off-highway vehicle hands-on classes uh, or through a class from the uh, ATV Safety Institute, uh, also through the Motorcycle Safety Foundation Dirt Bike School. Uh, also, there are out-of-state safety training courses, and we honor the permits that you get from those. Uh, we also offer some online training. If folks can't get to a training site, then at least you can log on to the computer, go to our website, uh, beforeyouride.com, and uh, navigate to the training page, find the online training, and we've got links to a couple of providers for online training. You know, online training at least gives you awareness of some of the critical issues concerning off-highway vehicles. It doesn't impart the hands-on skills. That's why you go to a hands-on class. But all of this training is designed to provide instruction in basic skills, responsible operation, and talk about New Mexico's laws and rules. Uh, so the classes that we offer for off-highway vehicles, uh, there are four-hour basic skills classes in ATV and dirt bike. We have training machines available, so you don't have to have a machine for your kid, or you don't have, if you don't have the proper size machine, we've got you covered as far as it's either ATV or dirt bike. We also offer ROV and uh, UTV basic skills classes. Those are six hours long, a little bit longer, mainly because it takes more time setting up the course and moving the machines around. Uh, classes are free of charge, safety gear is available, uh, and like I said, loaner machines are available for dirt bikes and ATVs. Uh, our online training listed on our website, uh, we've got providers, uh, folks, the companies that are in the business of providing online training around the nation, and uh, there's three companies that we have links to for general off-highway vehicle or ATV training. Uh, ASI is that ATV Safety Institute. Calcamai is a fee for, uh, fee for their certificate. Fresh Air is another training company. So you can choose any one of those three and you can go through the material for free, but if you take the test and you want your certificate mailed to you in the mail, you have to pay a $25 or $29 fee. Uh, we do also have a link. Yes, question. Remember, if you're using it for agriculture, you are exempted from the uh, provisions of the act, so you're not required to, but any one of these three is gonna give you the same basic information, uh, and it'll also include New Mexico-specific content that these providers are required to, and it's basically talking about not drinking and driving, not uh, operating, um, uh, being sensitive to uh, critical areas such as um, uh, cultural, prehistoric uh, sites, uh, uh, water, um, um, riparian areas, things like that. But if you want to take, if you, you know, if you want to familiarize yourself more with ATV, any one of these three classes are really good. And at the end, unless you need that certificate for your job or for uh, to get onto a federal installation, you don't need to pay when you're done. You need to take the test. But if you want a basic understanding of everything, Take any three of the and then at the end, okay. And then uh, the bottom one is uh, uh, the ROVA e-course. So the, uh, like I said, the industry association for the side-by-side -side machines has put an e-course online and it is free of charge. There's a link there on our page also. You can go through the material and after you complete it, there is a little test. You take the test and you can print out a certificate. It doesn't cost you anything. As, as it stands right now, that course does not include the New Mexico required content that the legislature said was going to be necessary for a New Mexico approved course, but it's still got all the information that's good about operating those machines specifically. Uh, when we uh, teach people in our classes, we also include uh, something called Tread Lightly, and uh, that is a uh, um, a system for operating machines ethically uh, and responsibly. It was developed by the OHV industry uh, in partnership with uh, land management org organizations and also conservation groups, and they created the TREAD principles. Uh, you remember them by the word TREAD, T-R-E-A-D. Uh, the first one is travel responsibly, so things like uh, operating where, it's, where you're allowed to do so, uh, doing so when the conditions are right, uh, uh, things like that. 
respecting the rights of others, being aware that the trails that are there for OHV recreation are also multi-use trails. So anybody that's on a horse, anybody that's on a bicycle, anybody that's hiking could uh, be on those trails at any time and they have as much right to those trails as anybody else does. Uh, the E is educate yourself, so make sure you understand conditions on the ground before you go. Have a map or a GPS, uh, some way to keep track of your location and make sure that you're on an authorized route. Uh, the A is avoid sensitive areas, so I like, like I talked about, uh, cultural areas, uh, areas that are riparian. Uh, sources of water we have to protect. They're particularly important in New Mexico, whether they're there for wildlife or for livestock. We want to make sure that OHV users are not doing damage to that water resource. And then the last part is D, do your part. Uh, we want to make sure that folks, uh, if they are, are packing material into an area, that they're packing it back out. Uh, that they are operating their machines in a way that does as little uh, impact to the ground as possible. Uh, and that they're not making a bad example of themselves. So here's our program information, and that's also in the handout there. Uh, the Game of Fish, uh, Game and Fish uh, Department, off highway vehicle program, we're based out of Albuquerque, and that number will get you to uh, our uh, uh, admin person. And actually, that needs to be updated. That should be a 4728. Everybody make that correction, 4728. Uh, and then our website, uh, easiest way to get a hold of us. There's links to our email addresses uh, there on the webpage, and we respond to email pretty quickly. Uh, our program staff, there's three of us. Matt Seidel is our program manager, and there's his email uh, there and in the handout. Desi's information right here, and also my information. Now I mentioned uh, T-Clock, and this is a pre-ride safety inspection, a way of making sure that your machine is ready to go. Uh, all of your equipment, if you're using it for work, you know how, to, how important it is that your equipment be ready to go so you don't have to spend a bunch of time with it. Uh, and T-Clock is a way of just remembering the things that you need to check before you use that equipment. Tires and wheels, looking for inflation and damage to the wheels, damaged uh, objects in the tread. Uh, controls and safety equipment, that's where you would make sure that your throttle and brakes work correctly, uh, your seat belts work correctly, that there's mirrors uh, 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 properly adjusted. Lights and electrical, if you're going to be out after dark, you're required to have lights. Um, electrical equipment on there could be a winch, uh, other, other things, other equipment that are on the machine. Oil, fuel, and other liquids. Uh, if it's just a simple old air-cooled machine, you've got oil and fuel. But if it's more modern, then you've got probably a cooling system. Uh, you've got hydraulic systems for brakes and a clutch. Uh, and those all need to be checked before you operate the machine. And then the last uh, part of it, the last C, uh, stands for chassis, suspension, bodywork, other equipment, basically everything else on the machine that we haven't already touched in T-Clock, uh, making sure that the body parts are secure, uh, that the suspension works and doesn't squeak or clank. Uh, and then any other equipment, racks, uh, cargo carrying ways uh, that you have on the equipment. So that's what we've got to present to you here. Um, if there's any questions, be happy to answer them. And uh, is there anything I forgot to mention? Oh, so uh, if you're interested in getting training, uh, for yourself or you've got family members and you want to make sure that they get some safety training, just contact us. If you've got a site where we've got about 300 by 200 feet and it's flat and level, free of obstacles, we can conduct one of our training classes, uh, the four-hour class, like I said, for ATVs, and we have machines available. Uh, nationwide, I believe there is a 4-H program that does the same thing for, uh, for agricultural users, uh, and particularly their kids. Uh, and then uh, for the side-by-side -side machines, like I said, we don't have a fleet available, but if you can uh, get four or six people together uh, with their machines, then we can offer a class uh, for you guys just about anywhere that there's room for us to do it.
Uh-huh. And uh, our course is uh, accredited through the Department of Public Safety. So we do go around the state training fire crews, law enforcement, state land office folks, people like that. Uh, and then we provide them with accreditation from the Department of Public Safety and they get continuing uh, professional develop credits out of that. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, and on that topic, uh, if you are doing recreation in a national forest, uh, you are required to have uh, what they call the motor vehicle use map. So the forests went through a travel management process a couple of years ago, and the end product of that was a motor vehicle use map that shows all the roads, trails, and areas that are designated for OHV recreation in a national forest. So like Desi was saying, for a particular ranger district, you would need to have the map for that ranger district so that you can know that you are on a, an authorized route. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. <laughs>